Hi everybody and welcome to my Domestica Live today. Thank you for turning up. Um, my name is Dan Kelby and I'm a character designer in the animation industry. I um, work for a lot of studios from uh, Netflix to Disney TV animation to um, Cartoon Network Studios. Um, today we're going to be designing a character in Photoshop from a series of reference images on a template that, um, that we'll all be working to. Um, I'm going to show you my process, we're going to do some fun silhouettes and thumbnail sketches and hopefully come up with a final character design at the end of the session. Um, in terms of the way that I work, I like to work uh, digitally in Photoshop or Procreate. Stylistically, I tend to go for like really bright, bold colours, and um, I design with a lot of shapes and straights against curves, which is a design theory that I'll touch upon when I'm doing the presentation. Um, and I just like to design kind of unique, fun characters, uh, try and push them a little bit outside of the norm with um, funny textures and uh, different line weights and things like that. So, um, yeah. I'm happy to get started. I'm, I'm raring to go. So um, if you'd like to follow along and we'll have some fun drawing together. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll get to them as I'm drawing. So I'll be uh, I'll be multitasking today, which is uh, which is going to be fun. <laughs> cool. So I'm working in Photoshop for this session. Um, you can work in any program. You can work in Procreate or Clip Studio or Paint Tool or anything that you like. You can also work on pencil and paper. Um, I'm going to be starting off by doing some silhouettes, and you can do those with a pen, a Sharpie, or something like that, um, or obviously do them digitally along with me. So um, yeah, so let's get cracking. So. Um, our sort of brief for the session is basically um, I'm going to design a tiger detective and uh, there's a website, well, it's an Instagram profile called Character Cues, which is on screen now. Um, it's really good to, um, if you're having trouble with coming up with an idea, say sometimes you want to draw something but you don't know what to draw. Um, I have that all the time. And sometimes a little prompt thing like this is a really good way of sort of getting the juices going. Um, it's called Character Cues, uh, it's on Instagram. And so I went on there the other day and I found the prompt of Tiger Detective. I thought that was pretty cool, I love drawing animals. So um, hence why I've got all these lovely reference images on the left hand side. Now, when we design anything as a character designer, it's really tempting to start drawing like straight away as soon as you get a brief in or as soon as you get a little cool little prompt like this. But it's important to stop and gather some reference first because we use reference to inform our designs and to make them feel authentic and sort of true to life and um, to give them kind of aspects that we can recognize. Um, even though we're pushing a, a 2D stylized design for animation, because remember that animation is exaggeration, always remember that when you're drawing for animation. Um, we don't want to just draw you know, a photorealistic tiger, we want to have a bit of fun with it, we want to push the shapes about, we want to push the textures around. But finding references like this will ground our designs in the real world, okay? Because we're exaggerating reality, basically. So just to run through these really quickly, um, Tiger Detective, right? So I'm kind of thinking 1930s, 1940s, sort of film noir, Humphrey Bogart style guy, um, bit of a gumshoe, you know, think Bob Hoskins and Who, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, great movie. Um, so Tiger, right? So what's the first thing we do? We go and get some reference images of a tiger. And I always find that with animals, it's a good idea to get different angles, um, different angles of the head. So like a front view, a side view, and a three quarter view at the bare minimum, because you know, to be honest, I haven't drawn a lot of tigers before, and you think you know what they look like, but it's always good to see them from different angles. Um, I've got some fashion images here because I want to have my drawing be authentic to that era. So we've got Tiger Detective, which is quite a loose brief, but for me, I want to go sort of 1940s. So obviously, I'm going to go and find some 1940s images, you know, this different style of trousers that they wore and um, how their waistcoats hung, different coats that they had on. Um, even like the sort of ties that they wore, things like that. So I can use those as a jumping off point for my shapes. Um, this is an image of Jack Nicholson from Chinatown where he plays a private detective. And I love this one because he's got this kind of like broken nose, right? He's obviously, um, he's got some bandages on his nose. He's obviously been in a fight. So that's something that we can put on our detective to give him a bit of an interesting visual cue. Like maybe he's a, he's a bit of a bad boy or maybe he's been in a fight or something like that. And it, it just gives you an interesting hook to uh, draw you more into the character's personality. I like this guy on the bottom left hand side because he was more of a kind of relaxed uh, relaxed detective, I suppose. You know, he's back in the office, uh, really nice kind of film noir vibe with the um, light coming through the the, um, the window there, the, through the blinds. And he's got his badge on his belt, which I really liked. And I also liked his suspenders, so maybe we could put some suspenders on. Uh, this one was basically just to see what the hat looks like from the front because I wanted him to wear that classic kind of fedora hat. Um, 
And also, this guy had a quite an interesting face, so maybe we can do an older design. And then I've just got a load of detective badges, um, mainly for the shapes. Um, I don't think they're authentic ones. Perhaps they are. Maybe they're props. I don't know. But we can mix and match some of these together. So, um, yeah, so here's the template. Um, I set up, so I've got the brief at the top. I've sorted everything into groups. I tend to group all my layers together in Photoshop just to keep my workflow really clean. Um, you can also do this in other programs. So we've got the brief on the top there, which we can show and hide. Got my reference images on the left, which we can hide as well. And then this folder here called work is the one that I'm going to be obviously working in. So if we expand that downwards, uh, I'm going to double click this one and I'm going to hit one. This is going to be my first silhouette. Um, the way to start generating ideas is different for a lot of people. So um, some people do thumbnail sketches and like scribble stuff out. Some people do quick um, silhouettes, which is what I'm going to start with now. Uh, and some people do things like they'll do a random like ink blot and then they'll draw, they'll draw over it. Some people will write a brief, write a spider diagram out and, and, and approach it from a written perspective first. There's tons of different ways that you can start the process and none of them are right or wrong. So you pick whichever one works for you, right? Um, personally, I'm not great with silhouettes, <laughs> so this will be fun. Um, but let's get going, right? I tend to prefer thumbnail sketches. I'm, I'm more of a sketcher than a, than a, than a silhouette dude. Um, but I am also, I'm always thinking about silhouettes when I'm doing my sketches. Um, just, and I've, I've garnered that through experience, you know, I'm always making sure that my sketches are going to read as a flat black shape, even though they've got detail in the middle of them. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've got this, um, it's just a dark, it's just a solid black brush. Um, you can use any kind of solid brush for this. There's, there's the kind of uh, chalk type brush. There's this one with a little bit of a taper to it. And then there's one here that I've got. Oops on color, you know, which is a bit thinner. But the good thing with silhouettes is that I recommend that you stay zoomed out um, so that you can see the whole thing because the idea about silhouettes is that it's all about clarity and a quick read. You need to be able to read them from a distance. So we don't want to start sort of zooming in and out and then just kind of, you know, zooming in and doing a silhouette of the head and then pulling out and then zooming in again and detailing it. This is meant to be a quick process. So when I'm doing my silhouettes, I tend to start with shapes. So, you know, the trench coat of, a, of this detective Let's start with a sort of cut-off triangle. And you notice that I'm being really rough. Um, you know, I'm just sort of scribbling stuff in. Um, the trench coat has got this kind of, um, you know, like this colour popping out the side. Um, and let's sort of think about, like, his feet could probably come down here. Uh, maybe sort of out here like this. Um, do, 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 do. You know, really quick, really basic. There's his tail. Um, one thing you can do, which I do very, very frequently, is to flip the canvas, and that refreshes your eyes. So if you're drawing, for example, someone's face and you find that you, you know, you always draw one eye bigger than the other or there's something off about your character's face and you're not really sure what it is, um, flipping the canvas will sort of refresh your eyes. So you can do that by going to image at the top. This is in Photoshop, uh, image rotation and then flip canvas horizontal. Um, and that's just a really quick way of refreshing your your eyeballs right because what i found just then was that um my character was leaning too far forward so i used the transform tool which is command t um on the mac or control t and it brings this little box up and then we can you know we can hold down the command key which would be the uh the alt key i think on the pc and just sort of drag this handle around so i can tilt him backwards a bit and then i can flip my canvas back again so again that's image image rotation flip canvas horizontal um, and let's have his hand in his pocket like this. So, there we go, his collar's sort of coming up there. Um, maybe he can be smoking. I mean, you know, obviously we shouldn't be smoking, but it was the 40s, right? So uh, these kind of detectives were always uh, smoking and giving a bit of attitude like that. So let's say that that's our first one, okay? Um, a little bit lopsided, so let's transform again. Um, and that's your first silhouette. Really rough, really basic. Um, we can hit Command-T again, and we can sort of squash him down a bit if we want to. We can make him a bit fatter if we like. Um, and then I would always sort of call that one. This was would be if I was to be submitting, submitting it to like an art director or something. It's always a good idea to number your images so that they can quickly feed back and say, oh, I like number one, I like number four. Oh, you know, it's just a communication thing. So we're going to keep that on one layer, and then I'm going to make a new layer, which is in the Layers palette. If you haven't got that open, it's in Window and then Layers. Um, so hit the little plus icon next to the trash bin, and then where it says Layer 1, I'm going to double-click, and then I'm going to hit 2 on the keyboard and hit Enter. 
and uh, then I can make a new silhouette. Um, somebody's asked if I always use Photoshop, and uh, I'd say it's about a it's about a fifty fifty split really for me. Um, Photoshop is kind of the industry standard still, although I do kind of find that a lot more people are using things like Procreate and um, Clip Studio. And to be honest, like I think that's a good thing because I think that Photoshop uh, kind of you know is falling a little bit behind in terms of um, uh, being tailored to artists. So I think that a lot, there are a lot of other programs that um, that are better for artists than Photoshop. Um, regardless, it is still the industry standard, which is why we sort of um, I, I lecture at my local college, art college, and um, we teach all the students in Photoshop because it is still the kind of de facto um, program. But that doesn't mean that you can't use it to generate ideas. I, I've used Procreate to um, do professional work in before. Um, I've I, I like to use Procreate to sort of do sketches on because I find that I like drawing with the Apple Pencil rather than a stylus. I'm working on a um, Cintiq, uh, Wacom Cintiq, um, which is great and really, really big. But this pen doesn't feel like a normal pen to me. Like the, um, I find that the Apple Pencil is really super awesome for um, that tactile old, sort of like old school pencil feel. And I think that Procreate has um, a lot better brushes than Photoshop. Um, I, th I mean, I think that the main thing is use whatever software works for you, right? I mean, you can save out PSDs, Photoshop files from other programs now. So you can always just save them out, um, you know, work in Procreate and then save out a layered Photoshop file from there. And then you can open it in Photoshop or send it to somebody as a Photoshop file and then they can carry on working on it in Photoshop. There's a lot of nice like cross-platform stuff that you can do these days. Um, and I've done that to myself, you know, I've. Um, I've gone downstairs, I work at home in my house and I'm in my office right now, but sometimes I'll go downstairs and I want to get away from the desk and I'll go and um, I'll go and sketch downstairs on my iPad to generate some thumbnails and then I'll send them to myself if you like, I'll airdrop them to my computer uh, as a Photoshop file and I'll open them in Photoshop and sort of refine them. The thing about Photoshop is that I, I much prefer using it for um, stuff like turnarounds um, because the Cintiq that I'm working on is like here is a really big, really big one. It's a 22 inch screen. Um, and I wouldn't use my iPad or Procreate to do like fiddly stuff like a turnaround because for me, I'd want like as big a screen as possible, right? Um, there's another dude. He's more of a square shape. So if we sort of, um, I'm always thinking about shapes when I design. So if we think about this dude in terms of, whoops, in terms of his, his main shape, like the first one, the first one's more of a triangle like this and the second one is more of a square so this guy is probably more of like a bruiser of a detective right he's uh, squares project strength um because they're quite solid think about bricks and uh, safes and things like that and um you know oh no sorry that's my bad what am i doing sorry about that um yeah heavy shapes like that weights all that sort of stuff bricks um so I always tend to design with a main shape in mind. Circles are usually happy and friendly shapes. So think about like Baymax from Big Hero 6. Um, characters like that, friendly, shapes are friendly. Um, where are we? Okay, so there's two. So maybe this guy could be like the sort of police chief detective. I don't know. Let's pop him next to this one. Uh, and we'll do a couple more because I want to get onto some drawing. Um, let's do another pose. So. Uh, when you're posing characters, think about shapes as well. So I want to do one who's kind of, he's, a, he's another triangle, but he's leaning forwards because triangles can be quite dynamic when you sort of put them at an angle. So if you want to do a sort of dynamic pose on your character, think about an overall shape like this, sort of, you know, leaning forward, ready for action, right? Um, so his like, let's say his foot is kind of out the back here like this. And also a good thing to use when you're um, designing uh, silhouettes, especially if you want to sort of work quickly, is the transform tool. Um, I use it all the time. Um, and also the lasso tool to make selections with, which is L on the keyboard. Um, you can just sort of draw around something like this, like that leg just then I can draw around this leg here and I can hit Command T. Again, that's Control T on the PC. And then I can just sort of bend limbs around and it's just, I always think of the this process as being very sort of malleable, right? So don't stress about it. 
Um, and don't ever get too precious about your silhouettes because they're only rough ideas at the end of the day. They're only like really super quick. And then they're designed as like a starting point. Okay. Uh, his coat's sort of coming down here. Yeah, so I tend to do I tend to do probably as many of these as I can. And I recommend that you do that. Like, don't ever pick your first idea. <laughs> or if you want to pick your first idea, that's fine. But make sure that you do at least, like, I don't know, 10 other ones, right? Because when you, you've all found the same thing, I'm sure. Whenever you're designing and whenever you're coming up with ideas, your first idea is kind of like your go-to, maybe your cliche idea. Um, and it's not usually the best one. I always find that I have to kind of draw for at least, you know, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour on my silhouettes or my thumbnails to gradually like find my, you know, get into a groove and like find my flow basically. Um, and then I tend to go back to my first ideas and think, oh, what the heck was I doing with those? <laughs> They're awful. But it doesn't matter because it's digital art, right? So what we can do is we can just chuck them in the trash bin um, and nobody ever has to see them, thankfully. Um, yeah, so in terms of generating ideas, uh, more is more, right? Um, and if you want to design um, and then go back to your first idea, that's totally cool as well. Because you might get lucky, you know, your first idea might be super duper awesome and, um, you know, you peak super early <laughs> and then you just, um, you know, after that, all of your ideas kind of pale in comparison. And that's fine because that's part of the process. I mean, I've, I've had that happen to me before. Um, sometimes I have gone back to my first idea, but the point is that you should always try out other avenues. Because otherwise it's like leaving lots of doors closed to yourself. You never know quite how far you can go. Um, okay, that's a cool one. So he's leaning forward and he's got a, he's got a gun. You know, he's ready to shoot a bad guy or something. Um, yeah, so let's just nah, let's stick with three because I want to do some sketching. Uh, I want to show you lots of different ways that I do things um, because I think it's important to be aware of lots of different processes and then you can kind of um, pick and choose which ones work for you. Like I say, I'm silhouettes not my strong suit if i do admit um i'm oh, sorry i just missed another question um how do i add movement to my characters um well i would say the best way to add movement to your characters is to first of all practice a lot of gesture drawing um, if you're not familiar with gesture drawing then that's basically like quick pose life drawing and it's it's not um it's not designed to um, be like a perfect representation of the person in front of you. It's more about capturing the mood and the flow and the movement, more, most importantly. And practicing um, gesture drawing will uh, strengthen your poses and it will add more movement to your characters like, you, like you've asked. So, um, I mean, a quick sort of hack way of doing movement is to make sure that you, your characters aren't too rigid, um, not too straight up and down, because that can provide stiffness. Um, one thing I see people do is that they have their limbs like doing the same thing on either side. So imagine like a toilet sign is my example that I always use. Um, you know, if a character's standing there with their hand, if they're waving and they've got both hands up like this, then that's a boring stiff pose. You want one hand up and you want another arm doing something else. Um, and another good way of getting movement into your characters is to tilt the shoulders and to think about um, tilting the shoulders and the hips and the weight that's in the character. Because when you... When we stand up straight, um, we still kind of slouch a bit, you know, we still kind of, um, nobody stands bolt upright unless they're a soldier or something. So if I was designing a soldier character, I would do something like that. But if I wanted to uh, provide something that looks more realistic and natural, I would think about the weight, you know, how people, it's just from observation, like seeing people out and about, how people sit, how people stand, how people walk. Um, and that sort of... Um, sketching people like that out in life or, or in cafes or, or kind of online you know if you find some pictures of people doing that is a really good way of um like building a visual library for um making a character more natural um especially if they're if they're in motion as well um so i'm just gonna i'm gonna leave those silhouettes up there i'm gonna shrink them down really quickly command t my favorite my favorite command i put those in a folder um which you can do by if you hold down the shift key, if you select your topmost layer, let's say, and then you select your bottom one with the shift key held down, and then you hit the little uh, folder icon, which is here in the layers palette, that will create a group. And then you can double click on there and name it. Um, so I could toggle them all on and off at the same time. It's all just 
housekeeping stuff. Um, so a good way of, um, so let's say I've done loads of thumbnails. Uh, one thing I like to do now is I like to start sketching, um, uh, sorry, we've done silhouettes. We're gonna do some thumbnails, um, but I like to do it with the symmetry tool because it's super quick. Um, so in Photoshop, when you've got the brush tool selected, if you go up to the top here, there's a little butterfly icon. If you click that, uh, where, at the top where it says vertical, um, that will give you a vertical line that you can then pull out and move on your canvas. Then if you enter, um, and basically that is a symmetry line. So if I draw on the left-hand side, then you can see that it replicates what I'm doing on the right-hand side. So it's cutting my drawing time in half already. And I like to just sort of start to sketch out a really basic series of shapes um, and proportions, you know, mega quick. So this is his body, obviously, and there's his legs. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. These are his feet. And the brush I'm using for this, um, it's set to a sort of gray color um, because <laughs> I find sketching in black to be intimidating for some reason. So I like to have that sort of, uh, <laughs> I don't know, mental hack, like, you know, tricking myself into thinking that, oh no, this, is a, this isn't a serious drawing at all. This is just a, a light gray one. Um, <laughs> it's funny the things we do, isn't it? Um, so I'm just drawing out shapes like this and uh, it's, it's just, you can see like it's super duper quick. And yes, it's a sort of rigid and stiff pose, but that doesn't really matter because the whole idea of doing it like this is that I just want to get this guy's main shapes and his sort of design down and then I can pose afterwards, okay, uh, based on my silhouettes. So yeah, again, I'm picking, I'm trying to taper my shapes down. I'm using my razor tool just to carve things out. And you'll notice that I haven't put the face in yet. And that's because um, I find that if I start to get distracted by the face, um, I'll just spend ages on it because we all want to get the faces right because the face is like the most important thing right on the character, um, especially the eyes. You know, if you, get, if you get stuck doing the eyes early on, you'll be there for half an hour and then you won't do anything else. So um, I, I leave the face as long as I can before I before I want to get it in because otherwise you can just get sidetracked. And the whole point of this phase is to kind of, I mean, we are thinking obviously, but we're not we're not honing in on a design yet. We're still quite broad, um, so I just want to get these sort of basic shapes in, and then I can start to put a face in in a second. So let's think about some costumes. So this guy in the bottom left hand corner. Um, with his suspenders, like, I quite like those. So let's let's put some suspenders in. Again, I'm just using I'm just using a really simple um, like round brush for this sort of stage. People always ask about like, oh, what brush shall I use? You know what? Um, and it's similar to the Photoshop question. It's just use whatever you think works for you. You know, whatever you're comfortable with. And also, um, don't be too worried about am I using the right brush? And you know, um, can I, I if I download this brush? it'll automatically make my drawings like super awesome and I'll be the best artist in the world. Because it's like any tool, it's, it's, it's how you use it rather than what it is. I mean, there's artists out there that do incredible drawings with like the default hard round brush. Um, so it's not necessarily about the brush itself. Um, although having said that, like I find psychologically, um, if I can find a brush that I really, really like, then, then it does make me want to draw more and it does sort of take the pressure off myself when I'm sketching. And that's another reason why I like Procreate, because um, I can naturally use their sketching brushes and, and be happy with it. Whereas sometimes in Photoshop, if I don't have the right brush and I want to sketch some stuff out, I feel like I'm working like against the software, you know? Um, you may have noticed that I'm wearing a rather fetching black glove, which is a super cool fashion item I know. Um, some people ask me about this and they're like why the heck have you got this on and why are some of the fingers missing? Um, this is just a little uh, sort of cottony nylon -y type glove and it basically stops my hand sticking to the screen. I'm working on a big tablet in front of me that's rather large that you can't see and uh, your hands get sweaty when you draw. I know it's not very glamorous so if you are drawing all the time and pulling your shoulder across the screen because I, I always draw with your shoulder or your elbow by the way not your wrist because you can just make better sweeping lines, more confident strokes. Um, your hand can get stuck to the screen when you get really sweaty because these things can get quite warm. And this just kind of helps me glide over the screen. Um, I used to, uh, I, I bought this one. I used to, I used to do, <laughs> I used to have a cotton glove that I bought from my local pharmacy and like cut the fingers off it. <laughs> I had to keep putting them in the washing machine. Um, so in the end, I was just like, I think I need to, um, I think I need to upgrade this system. So yeah, 
a bit more hygienic as well. Um, so there's my sort of first main shape. So I'm going to turn the um, symmetry mode off because I want to put this badge on, but only on one side of his body. So again, if I go up to the butterfly icon, um, I don't think you can see my menus coming up, but if you click the butterfly icon at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top, it says symmetry off. So I'm just going to turn it off. Um, and I want to put this badge on here, a bit like this um, reference image that we've got there. And let's just do a general shape now. We can refine the shape later on. Um, and let's get that face in. Okay, so now back to symmetry. I can click the butterfly and then I can go to last used symmetry, which is um, the one that we used before. And I might zoom in for this, but I'll just show you um, a quick trick and to split the window up, which is something that I really like to do. So what I want to do now is I want to zoom in a bit and look at his and do his face, but I want to keep like a zoomed out view of it as well to see that it's working from a distance. So if we go to window, uh, arrange, and then new window four, which is, and then the document name, which is the third one from the bottom. That'll open the same window in another tab like this. Same document. Go back to window and then arrange again, and then two up vertical, which is four from the top in the options. And you'll see that it's put them next to each other like this. And I can basically, I can control them independently. So the one on the left, I can have zoomed out. I can move this one over like this. I can so it's two windows that are splitting the screen, but it's the same document. So you'll see that I can now, I can zoom into this one independently and I can say, draw some eyes in, and then you can see it updates on the left-hand side, like live, if you like, um, which is a really cool thing that you can do to, when, especially when you're painting, if, if you ever um, want to paint like an eyeball or something that's really, really detailed, you can use this to sort of zoom in in one window, like mega close, like let's say, 200% or whatever we are now, and um, paint your eyeball, uh, you know, super detailed. And you can you can look on the left hand side and check whether it's working or not. Um, it's just a really simple, cool way of um, keeping keeping an eye on things. <laughs> Pun not intended. Um, that nose is a bit wide. So again, I'm using the lasso tool around there. Uh, back to the move tool, which is V on the keyboard. Command T transform I'm holding down option which is on the Mac uh, it'll be alt on the PC and if I do that I can I can stretch this um, on both sides at the same time uh, otherwise if I don't do that if I just don't hold a key down and I just move this in it only does it to one direction and we don't want to do that um, what are my favorite type of characters to create well um, I like drawing people um, I really do it's, it's I mean I like drawing animals too but I'm, I'm kind of like a people watcher, um, not in a creepy way, <laughs> just like I like looking at, um, uh, you know, how people interact and how people walk and talk. And um, and that's a good thing to, that's a good practice to have as a character designer or any kind of um, designer for animation, especially if you want to do pure animation, like, you know, watch it, watch how people walk, you know, um, take mental notes of how people sit and um, what their heads are doing when they're talking to each other. Because... Like I said at the start, that, that sort of thing will give your designs, um, you know, realism, even though even if they're pushed, right? Because um, everything is rooted in a real life example in animation. Um, and it's the things that we sort of see and, uh, and remember that influence our style, right? Um, people always ask me about style. And I think that your style comes from your life experience. And I think your style comes from um, you know your favorite artists and your what you're sort of into at the time I mean my style has changed a lot over the years I used to be like mr. super clean line artwork dude and um, I always found like it was really tough for me to clean up a sketch because I was always worried that I was gonna mess up my line artwork and and nowadays I, I don't really care and I, I, I actually use my um, sort of sketch layer as part of the final because it gives it that kind of um, that like rough and ready feel that I really like, because um, I'm sure that a lot of you are the same in that you've tried, you've gone, you've done a really, really lovely sketch that you're really proud of and you really like the feel of, um, and then you've gone to clean it up and it's completely lost all of its life, right? Uh, so one day I just decided not to do that anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, people, I love drawing animals. Um, I like, I like to push proportions and I, I like to. Um, I like to exaggerate things, so that's why animation's you know such a great job because you get to do that for a living. 
Uh, I'm just going to finish this one off, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just do another one over the top. Um, I can fix this. I can fix proportions and things later on. Um, I think I probably want to move his waist down a bit. So again, transform tool, my favourite. Um, why would I redraw it when I can just do this? <laughs> you know, there we go. That took about a second. His braces now a lot longer. He's got very short legs. Um, so that's kind of one. So let's do that one for my thumbnail. Um, and let's pull that down and call this two. Uh, which facial feature is the most difficult to draw? Asks Amy. Um, eyes, definitely. <laughs> um, and that's because they're the first things that people look at, right? And especially if you're doing eyes uh, in like a three quarter view or something like that, um, or a, a difficult, tricky angle, I always find that um, I always draw one bigger than the other. But again, that's why we, that's why I like to um, like flip my canvas a lot, um, just to just to sort of make sure that I'm not falling into those sorts of those traps. Um, let's put a hat on this one. Um, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> I think faces are hard to draw in general, um, and the way to the only way to improve is obviously to practice, right? So when I'm not doing client work or when I'm not doing like personal work, um, I'll just I'll pick some faces off the internet and I'll just try and stylize them and caricature them and um, see if I can find some interesting shapes. And even though you're sort of exaggerating them and stylizing them, you're still learning how to draw a nose by drawing, by practicing drawing the noses, noses right on, on, on people. Um, so I would say that if you struggle with characters, uh, sorry, if you struggle with faces, um, start with, Start with a photo of a person and try and do, copy it as close as you can. Don't worry about exaggerating it or cartooning it, um, just to get used to drawing the features. And also, I know it sounds a bit sort of archaic, but drawing the skull can help you with the facial proportions and where like uh, cheekbones, um, cheekbones can be pronounced and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm lucky in that, like I say, I, I just love drawing people, so I, I do that all day anyway. Um, but it, as with anything else in art, it just comes with practice. Um, and once you've sort of got that practice, it's nice to kind of, you can start messing around with things. Like I really love giving my characters like big ears and big noses, because again, I like to um, I like to exaggerate stuff and really push it. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm drawing over my, um, I'm drawing over my uh, second silhouette because um, that will save me time because I'm, I've got the body proportions in now, but I'm just doing like different different sort of facial options. Um, so maybe this one's a bit more sort of moody. I don't know. It's like his nose is a bit longer. Um, let's see if we can, let's see if we can like really push this. There we go. So I'm doing this kind of shape like that. Like always think about shapes because that's what all of your um, designs are built off. Shape plays into silhouette, which plays into um, clarity, you know, and then they're easy to pose. If you have trouble with turnarounds, um, you know, building your characters out of basic shapes is a good way to uh, to be able to translate them more easily into 3D if you're doing different views of them. Oh, I'll tell you what, we'll, on this guy, we'll, um, we'll put those like, bandages on his nose. Remember that on our reference on... Uh, Jack Nicholson over here, he's got his bandages. So yeah, let's put those on there. He's been in a fight this one. He's a bit of a mean, mean guy. How do I decide on my facial expression? It's all down to um, what the character's personality is. And I know that sounds obvious, but um, you know, think about when you do your characters, think about them as, as like, obviously like they exist. But think about them as existing for real, right? Even though they're in an animated show or in, in, a, in a film or in a, um, in a comic book or whatever. And like, um, what are they going? What emotions are they going through at that point in the story? You know, are they are they mean? Have they had a bad day? Are they uh, are they exhilarated? Are they kind of um, beaten down? Are they are they upset about something? Um, and like, think about how you would feel if you if you were going through those emotions. And and sometimes I find that I find myself making the same expressions as my character, <laughs> um, which can be really helpful because you can then sort of like you can almost feel uh, the drawing and you can feel the muscles in your face and think like, oh, I need to. I need to replicate that on my drawing. Um, it's handy to have a mirror nearby. Uh, that's what all the old Disney animators used to do. There's all those great photos of them and their drawing boards, you know, um, making funny faces into the mirror and copying copying their own faces. So again, that's more sort of 
more about referencing. Um, yeah, or, or everyone's got cameras on their phones these days, so you know you could take a photo of yourself pulling a pulling a moody expression or something. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can practice. Um, but also, one thing to bear in mind with expressions is that I always say to people, um, think about squashing and stretching the face. So when you open your mouth, you know your jaw goes down, so that's a stretch. And if you like scrunch your face up, then you can pull the whole face into like a think of it as like a sort of rubbery ball. Um, and think about things like frown lines and you know if you put one eyebrow down you know where do we, where do, what effects does that have on the other parts of the face because remember that your features aren't kind of isolated all the muscles are connected together so a lot of the times when people do facial expressions and, and they're perhaps a little bit stiff it's because they'll they'll just like raise the eyebrows but they won't do anything to the cheeks and the nose because when you raise your eyebrows you no and open your mouth wide your nose kind of moves down slightly and stretches. It's only a very small amount, but remember that animation is exaggeration, as I said to you earlier on. So that's that's a good opportunity where you can really push things. Um, so yeah, I mean, same with um, same with the facial uh, the uh, the features question I got just then. Like, if you do have trouble with expressions, then um, just practice lots of different ones by looking at your own face in a mirror, or by um, you know getting reference off off the internet. Uh, a good exercise that I have my students do sometimes is to find um, like some expressions from the same actor or actress, um, like an expression sheet if you like. You can find them on Pinterest quite easily, and um, design it. You know, have their character do the same expressions. So you use the um, the reference of the actor or the actress as as, as your reference, um, and then you kind of replicate that with your own characters' faces. It's a really it's tricky. But it's a really good way of, of teaching yourself um, expressions. But yeah, in terms of how I decide on the right one for the character, it's um, what mood are they going through? What are they feeling at the time? Because remember, you know, we've got to convince the audience that these things are alive. So uh, don't be afraid to push the expression either. Oh, my symmetry's gone off. Better redraw that, haven't I? There we go. So this guy's got a trench coat on. Um, like I say, I've drawn it over the top of the other one. This is just a, again, this is just a really quick way that I use to generate ideas. I realize that, you know, this is a very stiff, boring pose, but this can be the basis of, um, the basis of the character before I get, get into actually posing it. And this is, you know, and you can, I've, I've sent stuff like this to sort of art directors before, um, costume options. Um, someone's asked, how do you come up with props for the character? Um, well, I would say that um, think about what think about the story again. Like, what type of character is it? You, so this is a this is a kind of a detective, right? So um, think about their habits as well. So if he's a smoker, he's going to have a pack of cigarettes somewhere. If he's a drinker, he might be hiding like a hip flask of bourbon or something like that, right? Um, obviously, the hat is part of the costume. Um, he'll he'll probably want a gun because he'll be going into um, dangerous situations with. With criminals and crooks, um, so yeah, it's it's whatever you think the story um, requires from your character, and, and and also think about like authenticity. I mean, if you were a detective, what would you want? <laughs> Maybe a bulletproof vest. I don't know, but then you would have to think like, were they invented in the forties? Whenever I'm thinking about props and stuff, I, I you have to think about um, things that are still historically accurate, especially if you're doing a certain time period, right? Um, so yeah, and also, I mean, props can be really important. They can be, they can tell you a lot about the character's history. You know, if, if say, maybe he's carrying a photo of his dead wife or something that was killed by like the Al Capone of that era, who's probably like a rhinoceros or something. Um, and that would be a really important kind of character story point. You know, maybe he keeps it in his wallet or something. And that would be, that would class as a prop, um, be classed as a prop, but it's also a really important part of this guy's personality. Because remember, we're not just designing visuals; we're designing, you know, personalities as well. Um, I call it the the invisible. I talk about it on my course um, it's at the start, of the the first few lessons. The um, the visible and the invisible is something I talk about, which are, you know, the visible is obviously um, stuff we can see, so physical traits, proportions, shape, design, silhouette, that sort of thing. And the invisible is more kind of, um, you know, what's the character feeling? What's their backstory? Um, What's their personality, all that sort of thing, um, and you've got to marry the two together when you're a character designer. It's not just about doing cool drawings, 
Um, you want your drawings to look cool, obviously, but it's better to have, I think it's better to have a more interesting character that's perhaps not like a, as interesting a visual design, but you, but you remember them because of their personality rather than having like the best looking, cool, awesome character design in the world. And then personality wise, they're just completely dull and you won't ever remember them again. Um, I'd rather have that, but that's all personal preference. Okay, so here's, this guy's a bit meaner. Whoop. Uh, he's got his trench coat on. Um, so that's number two. That one's not number two, so there's one, there's two. So let's pull number two over here. Uh, I'm already kind of liking him a bit more. I mean, a lot of the stuff with character design is obviously we haven't got very much time together. Um, so you would just maybe do 10 of these and then send them off for approval to your your art director or your character lead or whoever you're working for. Um, and then they would come back and say, you know, really like this one. Can you mix the coat on number two with the um, with the hat on number seven or something like that? I've had that, you know, I have that loads of times. I remember that when you're doing the thing that I want you all to remember, especially if you want to do character design, is that um, revisions are just part of the job and um, being asked to do amends and things like that. It doesn't mean that you're a bad designer. It doesn't mean that you're not hitting the mark. It doesn't mean any like, anything like that. It's, Design is a collaborative process, right? Um, and when you're working on a team, um, you're all striving to hit the same creative vision. Um, and it's your job to try and guess what somebody else is thinking at the end of the day. So that involves a lot of back, back and forth, a lot of um, a lot of back and forth, a lot of kind of um, corrections, you know, getting your work back with loads of red lines written all over it and scribbles and notes and don't do this, do this. and um, when you first sort of receive that sort of feedback, it can be quite sort of disheartening because um, you think, oh, didn't I do it right? And, oh, I'm rubbish. And, you know, they should just get somebody else and all those horrible things that we think about ourselves as artists. But um, it's not a reflection on your ability. It's part of the process. I mean, design is just basically, it's, it's never really finished until the film comes out, you know. Um, I had one time on a, I was doing some characters for a, for a movie that's going to be out next year, like, um, with, with, well, coincidentally, a lot of animal characters in it. Um, and I worked on the character for two weeks and um, and then it just got cut, you know, and it wasn't anything to do with me. It's because the script changed. So it was like, oh, well, that character you've been working on, that's out now. And I was like, oh, and I felt really terrible about it because <laughs> I really like that character. But at the end of the day, you know, my job is to give them designs of whatever they need, whenever they need it. You know, it's not my place to question like, oh, you know, not get really upset and be like, oh, why have you got rid of that character and all that sort of thing. It's it's not my place to say. So, um, just, so you know, my response was, oh, and then like, okay, what do you want me to do today? <laughs> um, you know, that's just, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, really. So I'll do one more of these and then we'll, um, we'll try and pose one up. Um, we can go a bit longer, which, I mean, I'm happy to go as long as people want me to go. Um, I know I'm rattling through this, but um, I'm doing like a really super condensed version of my course in an hour. Um, but if people people want me to go longer, I'm definitely up for that. You know, it's not like drawing is hard. <laughs> well, it is hard, but it's not a chore. I love it. Um, okay, let's do another one. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm going to, again, I'm going to go over the first um, sketch just to do another costume option. Um, so what I can do is on the keyboard a quick shortcut for layer opacity, i.e., how light or dark a layer is. You know how transparent one is. Um, you can use the slider at the top of the layer palette, or if you're like me and you like using keyboard shortcuts, if you've got the move tool selected and the layer selected, you just hit a number on the keyboard. So three is 30% um, opacity seven is 70 percent and two is 20 percent and if you want to go back to 100 percent, it's zero it's not one because one is 10 percent right so think of them in 10 percent increments i usually think about 30 percent is a good one um another question how do you deal with rejection as a freelancer um that's a really good question because it is something that is part of the job um you just have to kind of i know it sounds really you just have to kind of keep putting yourself out there and like not take it personally, like what I was saying before about, um, you know, getting notes and stuff on your work. It is part of the job, you know, and a lot of times 
it's, it's sad to say, but a lot of times you'll apply for jobs and you won't ever hear back. It's happened to me a lot. And, and a lot of times you'll you'll apply for a job and then you'll you'll think you're going to get it and then they just go with somebody else um, because they've got somebody else in mind already or somebody's become available that they've worked be- with before and they know that they can do the work and they can do it quickly and they can do it well so they, they'll give it to them you know sometimes it is down to something as kind of unfair as that um, um but don't ever let it try not to let it affect your confidence because i know the rejection is a big part of it and you know i've been doing this since 2014 um, so still not that long, really, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I was rejected constantly for, <laughs> for months. Um, and it was actually that rejection that kind of uh, pushed me to uh, do things that got me my first job, ironically. I was really uh, annoyed because I was getting like passed over for stuff. And I was bear in mind that in the meantime, I was always, I was always working and putting my stuff on social media. And that, that's what helped me get my first job as well. So... Try not to create in a vacuum and think like, I'll post it when I'm ready, I'll post it when I'm good enough. I would say like, post it, start posting stuff now that you're pleased with and get feedback on it and, and you will improve. But um, yeah, I was I was just sick of being rejected all the time and I was like, oh, this is so unfair. And um, I went on the Cartoon Network Studios website um, and they have on their jobs page, they've got a little box in the, um, in the bottom right corner, I think it is, that says, um, it's basically like, oh, you can apply here. Um, you know, if there's no positions, you can send us your portfolio and your details. And if we have anything, we'll get back to you. And usually when you look at something like that, you're like, yeah, right. Um, but I was so annoyed. And like at, at the end of my tether, I was like, oh, I'm just going to apply. You know, nothing's going to happen. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then uh, I put my stuff in and then uh, in frustration. And then two days later, I got an email saying, oh, hi, we really like your stuff. Do you want to test for this new show that we're doing? And I went, holy crap yes please um i'd never worked on a tv show before um but that wasn't a problem that i was gonna you know let get in the way and um yeah it was apple and onion um which is a fun show if you've never seen it very surreal um yeah and and i was and i tested for it they they asked me to do a, a test which is what happens when you um you know work on a tv show especially they they send you some tasks to do and you usually get about a week to um to do them, you know, like I had to do a turnaround, I had to design a character, I had to um, uh, come up with, a, um, I had to do a character that was going to fit in with the show, and I had to come up with like my own character as well. Um, and yeah, they liked it, and um, and I got the job, and I was like, oh wow, that was cool. Um, and yeah, it was it's a real big learning curve, and it was like quite scary at first. But if I hadn't have taken that risk of just being like, I'm going to apply for this anyway, and if you know if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Uh, I, I wouldn't have got that job. And so I guess the moral of that story is, even if you don't think you're ready, like you still put yourself out there for stuff. And just, I know this sounds like really unhelpful advice, but kind of almost like expect a rejection. Um, and I don't mean that in like, I'm not good enough to work at this, but th- there's just so many people out there that want to get these jobs. And I think if you hang all of your hopes um, on getting like the first one you ever apply for, you're going to sort of set yourself up for disappointment. Um, and again, the key is just to like keep plugging away and uh, talking to artists on social media and and going to events. Like I went to um, CTNX Animation Expo uh, in LA two years running, I think it was. Um, I got feedback on my work and, and that was really, really helpful. Um, Give me confidence and also just, you know, seeing people in the industry and be like oh you know this is something that i can be a part of and and being out there with fellow students and fellow people that wanted to work in the industry and sort of seeing that we were all kind of like in it together right and that um it was kind of like a club that we were all in it was really nice um and and going out there and and meeting artists and showing them my work is a is a form of kind of networking and i do i do sort of hate that word but um it gets your work in front of people's eyes and the quickest way to improve is to get feedback on your stuff right um so that sort of gives you that can give you confidence as well you can learn from people you can get feedback um and then you know hopefully (laughs) you can um start to get some traction um i guess my main advice again would be like don't ever stop creating just because you get rejected It's, it's just part of the um part of the deal i'm afraid uh yeah and the um and obviously you know connect with your fellow people on domestica because we're all learning here together as well like I, you know i take courses all the time on here you know i've got 
uh, Sorry Kim's one is really good. Um, and I'm doing another one, like a, a human figure drawing one at the moment. I can't remember the, the name, sorry. But um, that's another thing, by the way, like never stop learning. Just because I'm a professional doesn't mean that I've stopped, you know? Because um, art is all about practice and learning new skills and, and being competitive and, and being able to offer stuff that other people can't. So it's like, well, now I, you know, I want to learn how to draw in ink, for example. Um, I don't ever need to draw in ink, really, for, for what I do for my job. But um, I've got an interest in it. And one day I might want to do like a comic or something um, because I love graphic novels and comic books. So I want to kind of learn how to do that. Um, so, But I don't know how to do it. I've got some ink pens, but I don't know how to use them. So I'm going to um, watch a course and figure out how to do it. Yeah. Uh, OK, so this is the last sort of this. This is another coat. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like his makeup then. It's, well, his, his stripes still look kind of like makeup. Um, but like, you know, let's okay. So let's um, let's open a dialogue. Like, what 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 sort of problems do people struggle with? Like, what is it? Is it kind of like a mindset thing, or is it? Because um, I'm interested to hear about like how you all feel about your work, and because um, one thing I do like on my on my course is I, I try and sort of give you the tools to, to basically be brave enough to try to like not worry about your style insofar as people are always worried about it like oh my work doesn't look like anybody else's or my work doesn't look like the industry standard or, you know like my work doesn't look like it, the stuff that you see and it's like that's a good thing right because the moment that I started to not 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 really not care about my style but like I didn't get as hung up on it as I used to do it's like, I'm just going to draw like I draw, you know, <laughs> and then hopefully people will like it. And then I developed this kind of crazy, like bright colors and texturized uh, character design um, methodology, I suppose. And then people started to like really respond to it. <laughs> and that was me just having fun. So I think that I think that you certainly have to just be yourself, you know. Should we learn anatomy and come to character design before we can stylize it? Um, yes, I would say so. Um, although like don't. All right, full disclosure, guys. This is um, this is gonna get me kicked out of the art club. Um, but it's not like I know all the muscles on the human body, right? Um, I know enough anatomy to sort of get by, and that's another thing that I want to learn and get better at because there's always something that you can improve on as an artist, right? Um, I've got a skull kicking around here somewhere. That's up there. But I've got these kind of on my desk. I've got these kind of um, they're like echo shade type figures. These are from 3D Total, I think. Um, and these are really useful um, if I'm doing a pose like this, or like a human, and, and I want to just like look over at this and check the proportions and things and check that the legs are sort of kind of like the right shape. But uh, a quick way to learn the body, again, is to do like life drawing and gesture drawing. Um, I struggle with proportion, and that really helps you to, uh, to nail those. Um, but again, yeah, you don't have to get like an anatomy book from... The hospital and just copy all the images i mean if you want to do that great and if you've got the time for that even better um but i don't like i say i don't i don't have like an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, all the major muscle groups and arteries and bones um but it, it is something that i should improve upon i mean that's that's a that's an important point because that question so thanks for that because you should know how to draw something sort of properly or as or as kind of semi properly as uh, as possible before you begin to stylize it. Like don't stylize things before you know how to draw them. And that's a pitfall that people find with hands because hands are super tough, right? Um, and I think a lot of people, the problem that they have is that they just try and stylize them like right off the bat, um, which is tempting, I know, because hands are difficult. But the thing is that you have to kind of know how they work and how they the proportions and the shapes that you can use to draw a hand convincingly before you can start to mess with it um, because otherwise it can just end up looking like a bag of bananas or something um, yeah so um, same with I always use the example of a car right um, if I want to stylize a car not that I've ever been asked to maybe I should um, I, I would go and draw some real cars first um, and see this kind of goes back to the question we had earlier about about fa about facial features like how realistic can I get this car drawing? How much like the real thing can I um, can I get it? Um, and then start to mess about with the shapes because remember that like everything is built from shapes, which is how I sort of started this. So if I'm drawing a car and I'm going to start designing with the major shapes, obviously we've got like you know the frame and the wheels and the windscreen and all that sort of thing. Um, and then I can start to squash and stretch and pull them about. And that's how I that's how I learned how to draw like animals and things. Is that you draw the draw the real one first? We do go over this in the course, by the way. Um, 
trace over photos of things to find the shapes um, and then start to push those shapes around and like squash them about and stretch them and, and um, you know, or do all that sort of stuff. That's um, it's a really good way of, of learning how to stylize. Um, okay. Right, so uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to do this as the last one. Um, so we'll start to, right, so let's put these three next to each other. Oh, this, needs, this guy needs a badge, doesn't he? Um, remember, we need the badge on things. Um, where can I have this? Oh, we need, we need some buttons as well. I mean, these costumes that I'm sort of doing are obviously based on the reference here. Um, you can always have the reference up to look at, or you can, I mean, it's probably a good idea to hide it after a while, because otherwise you can become like dependent on it, and you'll find yourself like looking at it and then just copying it. Um, whereas the idea is that you're supposed to use it as kind of like more as influence than anything, so that you can come up with your own and way of doing things. There's his tail. Um, oh yeah, badge. It's a bit starey, but never mind. <laughs> He can have his badge on his belt as well. Or maybe this guy should have it like in a wallet that you can like flap open at people, you know. Like think about that sort of thing when you're when you're designing too. Think about how's this guy gonna move or how's he how is he gonna behave, you know, guy or girl, whoever you're designing. Um what sort of gait is he going to walk with, you know, how is he gonna slouch in his chair and is he gonna be mean? Is he gonna be uh is he gonna be more of a sort of benevolent detective? Is he gonna like help out the sort of the damsel's in distress, or is he going to be like a hard drinking kind of guy? Because another way that you can um, do research is by watching movies. Of course, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to just look at pictures. Um, play games as well. Like if I was designing a cowboy, for example, you could play something like Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> Not too long though, because then you won't start doing any work. But um, yeah, that would give you a good sort of feel for the uh, for the environment. I'd watch you frame Roger Rabbit for this character, just because I love that film. <laughs> How long do you spend on creating characters for potential clients? Well, I mean, that's sort of, um, that's dictated by the brief. Um, usually the first thing I do uh, when I get a, um, something like that from a client, like if I get a job, is to um, ask them about time, time, scales and time scales and time frames, you know. They say, oh yeah, um, here's the brief, and like I, I'll always go back to them and sort of say, oh, um, when would you like some first sketches back by, or um, how long do I have on this basically? And usually it's like a day for sketches, or um, could be less, could be half a day, it depends on the um, the deadline. Because uh, remember, it's your job to get it done in time as well as getting it done. That's a big factor in re-employability, let's say. Um, so yeah, certainly um, sketch phase probably about a day. Then I they'd go back to the client and um, I'd get feedback on them and then I'd have like maybe another half day or a day to sort of like amend them, send them back. And the thing that I always um, make sure that I do is I always keep my clients kind of in the loop, right? So if I'm working on sketches, I'll be like, oh, okay, just to let you know, I've nearly done with these sketches, so I'll send them over sort of this afternoon time around about 4 p.m. or whatever, um, just to keep them because because they appreciate that kind of communication, I think, because a lot of these productions and movies and stuff, they're all beholden to a schedule, right? Um, and they want to know time frames and um, when they can expect things by. And yeah, but it, it's kind of like, depends on the uh, on the job. Like I was designing um, characters, uh, again, like animal characters for a movie, and I had to do loads of background characters. And um, I had two weeks on each character. So the first week I was designing, um, I was doing like this sort of stuff, uh, pitching ideas, getting feedback, um, and then by the end of the first week, I would be like, they'd settle on a design, and then the second week, I would have to do like the turnaround and the technical stuff, like an expression sheet or or like um, a hand sheet, you know, so they could see how the hands are going to behave. Um, so yeah, that's um, that sort of thing. Whoops. I mean, when I'm doing my own personal work, it can be, well, you know what it's like. It can be any length of time, really. <laughs> But I try not to work on anything longer than like a day, maybe if I'm doing personal work. Otherwise, then it turns into work, right? 
Um, right, I know that we haven't got much time left, but I'm going to start to pose one of these up. Um, let's do it. We can do it. Right. Um, let's do them kind of. So let's say that I've got feedback on these and they like the middle one. Um, okay. Oh, my symmetry still on. Sorry. Symmetry off. Um, okay. So I'm going to get the chest in first. Um, so he's going to be, he's going to have his gun. Uh, I get like when I'm doing poses like this, I just like, I just scribble them out. You know, I'm not going to start getting precious about anything. Um, and anything like, if anything, like staying loose like this is, is a real bonus because again, you don't get precious about it. You know, you can always change things. You can always move them about, especially if it's digital because that's just the name of the game, isn't it? You know, that's why we do digit. That's why we love our digital program so much. It's like, I can just change it any, any second I want. Um, okay. That looks too small. Here we go. Here's an example. So I'm going to transform it down and I'm going to skew it down here a bit like that and deselect. Uh, okay, so he's kind of like leaning forward with his gun. Um, let's get these arms in really quickly. The sausage arms. <laughs> Again, I'm thinking silhouette on this one. So if we go back to my silhouette at the top here, it's kind of this third one uh, on the right hand side. Uh, maybe his arm wants to break the line of his coat there. And then his head wants to be kind of like forwards a bit. You can probably hear my pen scratching on the tablet, sorry. Uh, another concept that I talk about in the course, which is something that I'm I'm doing even at this stage, is the concept of, of straights and curves, right? You'll notice that there's a straight line here um, for his back. Um, and then, you know, his, his torso is like this nice sort of rounded, squishy curve shape. And then we've got another straight line here, and then we've got a curve here. It's all about opposing um, shapes in that way. So it gives your uh, characters lots of um, dynamic, uh, graphic sort of dynamics, if you like, I guess is the right word. Um, if you look at a lot of animated designs, you'll see that um, they do have these sorts of things in them. It's um, it's a really cool way to inject your designs with a lot of um, stylization. And also, um, you know, a good rule of thumb if you're if you're new to that concept is think about people and straights and curves. Um, straights are usually like bony surfaces. So if you were to draw, you know, like the front of a shin or something, you'd use a straight, but you use the curve for the back of the calf muscle. And then, okay, so let's here's a, here's a leg. So the back of the thigh would be a straight, and then the front of the thigh would be like a curve. And there's the knee. And then the back of the calf would be a curve like this, and then the front of the shin would be a straight. Um, and then that would go down into the foot. You know, there's the foot there, the best foot I've ever drawn in my entire life. So you've got a curve there and a curve there. And you've got a straight there and a straight there. It's all about rhythm and um, and, and creating visual interest in the figure. Because if you draw a leg like this, like let's say you draw a leg, um, you know, there's the front of the car, the thigh, sorry, and there's the back of the thigh, and there's the shin, and there's the back of the calf. You know, it turns into sort of sausage man pretty quickly, doesn't it? Because um, you've got curve, 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 and it looks like he's made out of balloons, and you don't want that. <laughs> Nobody wants to be made out of balloons, guys. So um, think about that sort of thing when you're designing your uh, your shapes, especially. So I'm carving away these sort of straights and curves here. Uh, right, that's just generally, again, I'm like I'm steering clear of the face for the minute because I just want to get this arm in. Uh, he's holding a gun. Um, and, and also something that I didn't mention earlier on as well is that you know I, I don't normally just use five reference images. I would have like a whole mood board of um, you know different gangster films, different different costumes of, of the era, um, just you know as much visual reference as you can as you can stand, um, because it's all fuel for your mind, it's all fuel for your design. Um, so I would have like sometimes I have separate boards for um, for like props. So the reason I brought that up is because like if I'm doing a gun, for example, like I think I know what a gun looks like. But it's not going to be that accurate if it's just out of my brain. I've never drawn a gun before. Same with a car, like I was talking about earlier. So I would go and find a gun. And most, most importantly, I would find a gun that was authentic to the time period that I want this character to be in. So the 30s or the 40s, you know, the kind of revolvers that the, that the police might carry. Um, you know, I wouldn't obviously have like a modern day gun he's holding. Certainly not like a laser gun. 
unless I was doing some kind of sci-fi detective, like a Blade Runner type thing. Um, so yeah, remember that when you're do when you're finding reference and, and props and stuff uh, to be that authenticity is really really important. Just holding this gun, and whoop. always like always start rough and then refine afterwards. Don't ever go to like final line artwork straight off the bat because you drive yourself mad. <laughs> And you'll eventually just get to the point where you know you'll have to start over over again anyway because you know the underlying if the underlying sketch isn't strong enough then there's no way that the that the final drawing will be will be good enough either. I mean, I'm I'm keen to like I know that this is a sort of like, like a short session. Um, but I really want to sort of interact with you all, and because um, you know, because I'm a teacher anyway, it's like it's nice for me to sort of answer people's questions and help people out. Because like the thing that I, the thing that I love about teaching is that you know I can hopefully, and, and being part of the industry, you know, is I can hopefully answer the questions that I didn't have the answers to when I was trying to break in and when I was trying to um, you know get a foothold in the industry and that sort of thing. So if you ever have any questions and stuff, um, you can just you know send me a message on Instagram or whatever. Um, my, what somebody's asked like what are my main influences? Who are my main influences? Um, I like artists like Corey Loftus, who's just got a brilliant sense of humour. Uh, my first influence was Quentin Blake, uh, who's the illustrator who worked um, on the, all the Roald Dahl books those kids' books that are just a big part of my childhood. But I'm also um, influenced by, like, not just animation stuff, like fine artists as well. Like, I'm a big fan of um, John Singer Sargent. You know, that painter is just incredible. Um, people like um, Soroya and um, uh, Ian McCaig is, one, is, like, my favorite concept artist. Um, he's just, like, such... I met him when I was in America. I went to his workshop at CTNX, and he was just, like, the nicest guy in the world. Signed my book and everything, and... Yeah, I love him. He, if you don't know who he is, he designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala for the Phantom Menace, and he also, um, you know, he's he's worked on like Terminator Two and Interview with the Vampire and um, Hook and loads of awesome movies like that. Um, and I also love uh, Drew Struzan, the poster artist. Um, he's just like one of the best draftsman illustrators of all time. Uh, I love a lot of it, like Rockwell. You know, the usual the usual suspects. Uh, Lion Decker. I've got a load of books behind me. You can probably see. I just I'm obsessed with like collecting art books um, and just like being exposed to. I, I, the, my favorite thing in the, in the world is discovering a new artist to love because um, I think that that can help with your own uh, style as well. Not in terms of like stealing things, but just in terms of um, you know it gives you ideas. It inspires you, and, and like I don't. I find nothing more inspiring than looking at other people's work. Um, I love that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I love graphic novels. I'm getting into a lot of um, anime at the moment, <laughs> um, which I never really... I, I saw Akira when I was younger. I'm pretty old, everyone. Um, and Ghost in the Shell and those kind of things. But like, I, I watched like stuff like Dora Hidoro was great. <laughs> Parasite was great. Uh, I'm watching Evangelion at the moment. I've never seen that before. That's brilliant. And you can see how it's influenced a lot of stuff that I didn't realize it's influenced, like Pacific Rim, for example, was clearly influenced by that, that movie. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how much of an influence Japanese uh, anime has had on, on Hollywood without you even knowing. <laughs> uh, yeah, here we go. Does anybody else have any other questions just i know that we're sort of getting towards the end like, i hope that this has been helpful I know, I know that it's been super duper quick um but again like if you have any questions that you think of after this session you can you can get in touch with me on social media um and also obviously like my course is eight hours long so it's lots of uh, lots of stuff like this lots of cool exercises um that you can do to to help sort of like develop your own style and improve drawing people and we do some animal drawing and we, uh, what else we do? We come up with a really cool, or teach how to write your own brief and sort of brainstorm your own unique character. 
Um, show you how to color things, um, how I do my coloring process. I mean, I couldn't get to that today, but um, you know how I lay my files out, color them in Photoshop, which you could do in any other program, um, which is kind of uh, industry um, appropriate because it's the way that I learned how to color on uh, uh, when I worked for Netflix. Um, really simple way of coloring and stuff. Um, and it gives you real flexibility with your files as well. So you can change colors really quickly and just send them off for uh, send off your revisions like in a matter of minutes. <laughs> so that's a really cool thing that we do on the course. Um, but yeah, I'd, um, I start talking to artists because <laughs> we're all different at the end of the day. We've all got different stories. And that's what makes art so great. You know, I want to, I want to see your stories. I want to see your characters. I don't want to see. And that's the main takeaway from my course as well. It's like, I don't want to see what I've seen before because why would I want to do that? I can just watch, I can just watch the original. I want to see your take on the world. I want to see how you look at things, you know, put me in your shoes, basically. That's what I always sort of say in terms of stylistic leanings of people. Oops, got a tangent there. And also, don't ever be afraid of art, right? We're all, we all look at the blank page um, and get intimidated. But at the end of the day, you know, we're not heart surgeons. We're just artists. Nobody's going to die if we do a bad drawing. Right, um, that's a little bit... Um, his legs are way too small, but I'll just I'll change those as I do this. So what we've done, um, I'm just going to wrap up now because I think we're out of time, sadly. Um, so what we did was we designed a lovely Tiger Detective. Um, we started off with some thumbnails at the top there. We did some, uh, sorry, we started off with some silhouettes at the top there. We did some nice um, thumbnail sketches where I just went through a few different costume options. Um, and then just as a little sort of finale, um, I started to put him into a pose. And this is basically taking one of my thumbnail designs, uh, the guy in the middle. I would have put a hat on him if I had more time, um, you know, in a pose, just to give him a bit of personality because it's interesting um, and it's important for you to sort of show your potential clients or your client the character in action. You know, I mean, we've designed them in a pretty rigid way, but they want to see the personality in the pose. They want to see him moving uh, as a reference for any animation that might happen. Um, and it just kind of makes the thing exciting, right? Because we all want to get excited about our characters. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know. I'm going to get the, uh, the nudge to stop in a minute, I'm sure. I'm just going to keep scribbling until then. Um, <laughs> cool. But yeah, I love to hear from people. Head's a bit big. Head's a bit big. See, I'm changing it all the time, everyone. Let's not get precious about it. Let's enjoy it. Right, thanks everybody. Thank you so much for watching and I hope it was helpful and you learned some stuff. Um, I'd love to speak more with you, so um, hit me up on my course, which is um, really fun, and uh, social media, and I really appreciate everybody um, watching me do my thing. So, thanks very much. The idea is like something very fragile. It was the hebra. I'm going to show you some examples. This is what we've got behind me. What more questions do you have here? How did you discover that you were doing it?